Now I'll introduce our witnesses for today's hearing. Our first witness is Lisa Elman. Ms. Elman is the Executive Director of the Commercial Drone Alliance and is a widely recognized authority on drone policy and law. Ms. Elman, thank you for joining us today and you're now recognized for your opening statement. Chairwoman Cinema, Ranking Member Cruz, and members of the Subcommittee on Aviation Safety, Operations and Innovation. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts at this important hearing today on how we can promote aviation innovation safely for the benefit of the American public. My name is Lisa Elman, and I am the Executive Director of the Commercial Drone Alliance and Chair of the Uncrewed Aircraft Systems Practice at Hogan Lovells, at the global law firm of Hogan Lovells. I am honored to provide remarks on behalf of the CDA to inform your work on the upcoming FAA reauthorization. The CDA is an independent nonprofit organization made up of leaders in the commercial drone and advanced air mobility industries. We work with all levels of government to collaborate on policies for safe and secure commercial drone integration. The commercial drone industry is delivering significant life-saving, societal, and economic benefits for all Americans. As just a few examples, drones are enhancing worker safety. In 2020, there were 54 accidents resulting in 13 deaths in the aerial agricultural industry including accidents in Texas, Colorado, Georgia, Illinois, Nevada, South Dakota, Missouri, and Kansas. Use of drones for these operations can prevent such fatalities. Drones are promoting infrastructure resilience, providing early detection of oil and gas leaks, and inspecting our nation's railways, bridges, and electrical grid. Drones are protecting the environment and enhancing sustainability offering a substitute for ground vehicles and reducing carbon emissions associated with traditional inspection methods. Drones are expanding access to medicines and critical supplies and democratizing aviation by opening the industry to a broader aviation workforce. Drones are enhancing public safety, fighting wildfires, and assisting with disaster response. In Florida today, Florida Power and Light Company is deploying and flying drones in response to Hurricane Ian. Advancing this industry will ensure America's global competitiveness, our national security, and our leadership in global aviation. But these benefits will be fully realized only if Congress takes action. Congress led the way in 2012 by mandating UAS integration. In the decades since, that mandate remains unfulfilled, and drones are often subject to application of incongruous regulations designed for crewed aircraft. Despite the best efforts of the FAA's UAS Integration Office and other supporters, the FAA continues to view UAS integration as, in its own words, a long road ahead and a significant challenge. Progress towards safe, scalable drone integration has been exceedingly slow, and America is falling behind other countries. Bold and decisive congressional leadership is necessary once again to spur progress for scalable UAS operations for the benefit of the American public. While there is much that can be done in the interim, the FAA reauthorization provides an excellent opportunity for Congress to demonstrate that leadership. I have included many legislative proposals in our written testimony. I will highlight just a few of them here. First, Congress should reorganize the FAA to better align responsibility for UAS integration with authority over UAS approvals. The core challenges with UAS integration do not relate to safety. Rather, they are process-based, featuring a well-meaning government bureaucracy designed for regulating crude aviation, struggling to regulate an evolving environment. Common sense changes to the current organization would assist the agency to fulfill its mission safely and efficiently. Second, Congress should promote U.S. competitiveness by enabling safe, scaled commercial drone operations in the United States, including by directing timely implementation of the Beyond Visual Line of Sight Aviation Rulemaking Committee's excellent recommendations. Third, Congress should invest in the future. Congress should support workforce development training for careers in drones, along with the use of drones to inspect local infrastructure, by enacting the DIG Act. We applaud Senators Blumenthal and Rosen for introducing this legislation, which recently passed the House. Congress should also enable research and development by streamlining and improving approval processes. We include many more proposals and details within our written testimony, and I'm happy to answer follow-up questions. The opportunity cost of inaction continues to grow as the gap between technology and policy in the United States continues to widen. Congress has the opportunity in the next FAA reauthorization to close this gap and bring the benefits of commercial drones to the American public. 
The Commercial Drone Alliance appreciates the opportunity to appear before you. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with you to ensure America's global leadership in advanced aviation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Gregory Davis, President and Interim Chief Executive Officer of Aviation, uh, a developer and manufacturer of electric aircraft. Mr. Davis is also a licensed commercial pilot and has had over 15 years in leadership roles at aerospace companies. Mr. Davis, thank you for joining us remotely today. You're recognized for your opening statement. Thank you very much for having me today. As you said, my name is Gregory Davis and I'm the CEO of Aviation manufacturer of electric aircraft based in Arlington, Washington. Uh, we are manufacturing the world's first all-electric uh, commuter aircraft integrating back. Mr. Davis, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. You're cutting in and out. Um, I, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna have our tech folks work on that for a second and we'll move on and then come back. Is that okay with everyone? Great. Uh, so we'll move to our, our next witness, um, our retired Colonel Stephen Luxian, who prefers to go by Lux. I like it. Lux is the executive director of the Alliance for System Safety of UAS through research excellence at Mississippi State University's Stennis Space Center campus. He pre previously served in the U.S. Air Force for more than 30 years, where he led the Air Force's first armed UAV squadron. Lux, thanks for joining us today, and you're recognized for your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Cinema Ranking Member Cruz and members of the subcommittee, thanks for the opportunity to testify today about uncrewed aircraft systems or UAS. <clears throat> I will speak today from my seven years experience as the executive director of Assure, a Mississippi State University-led alliance of 26 leading research universities and over 100 industry and government partners that serve as the FAA's center of excellence. I also served 30 years in the Air Force where I was fortunate to play a leadership role in the integration of UAS. From this perspective, I have to say it is mostly a good news story of innovation, growth, development, and safety. In 2014, Congress called on the FAA to establish a UAS Center of Excellence to provide the academic research, data, and support necessary to inform the FAA and its regulatory responsibilities to integrate uncrewed aircraft safely and efficiently into the national airspace system. In 2015, the FAA awarded Assure that responsibility through a competitive process. A lot has happened in the seven years since Assure was established. With the tremendous support of Congress, Assure has grown from a half a million appropriation to 14 million in matched funding annually. To date, congressional support for the FAA through Assure is approximately 91 million. These funds have supported more than 60 projects including advanced air mobility, cybersecurity, and the integration of UAS for disaster response, just to name a few. Assure Research has supported FAA rulemaking and the development of in industry consensus standards. Additionally, Assure continues to develop a network of worldwide affiliations to harmonize rulemaking and standards globally. Canada, the United Kingdom, Israel, and Singapore now have affiliate universities in the Assure Consortium. Currently, Assure is in discussions with Australia and New Zealand to develop affiliations there. The COE's work supporting the FAA has led to other developments. We are engaged in nine studies for NASA, which investigate the technologies to support uncrewed aircraft traffic management so critical to beyond visual line of sight operations, multi-UAS control, and improved aviation weather forecasting below 500 feet. Congress has also supported Assure through FEMA and NIST in the integration of UAS technology into public safety and disaster response. Assure is leading the development of Assured Safe, a, a federated ecosystem that will provide standards, education, training, testing, certification, and credentialing of first responders' use of UAS in the systems themselves. Although progress is being made on integration, there are two areas that I believe need attention. First, there is a need for a national UAS roadmap. From the COE perspective, I see the FAA waiting on signals and investment from industry to tell it where to focus its regulatory efforts. But industry is waiting on the FAA to develop pathways to certification and operations to help reduce their regulatory risk. 
the FAA should produce a detailed regulatory roadmap that includes identification of specific regulations and standards to support industry and public safety, an office of primary responsibility for each, and the research necessary to inform their development. It is critical that this roadmap have milestones and actual dates. The FAA should involve key stakeholders, including industry, academia, and standard committee leadership in the development of this plan. A detailed roadmap would help all stakeholders, including Congress, to provide appropriate resources, measure success, and make adjustments as required. Second, a sure request that Congress suspend its policy on cost share to help improve diversity and inclusion and it also increase the amount of research that is so needed to speed rulemaking and standards development. As we look to grow our capability, as we looked to grow our capability and capacity and include more partners, we found that cost share requirements are an obstacle to participation for minority serving institutions. Moreover, during the pandemic, assuring the FAA demonstrated that cost share reduced uh, cost share requirements led to actually greater participation in research. A trial period of relief would increase participation of minority serving institutions in research and eliminate the financial burden and risk across all COE universities. Increased regulatory progress would also incentivize industry to stay actively engaged. Thank you for your recent efforts to help secure the FAA's extension of Assure as its UAS Center of Excellence through May 2025. I look forward to your questions and collaborating with you and your staffs in the future. Thank you. Uh, we're still working through some of the technical difficulties with Mr. Davis, so we'll move on to our next witness. Um, welcome to an Arizonan, uh, Stefan Fimat, Vice President and General Manager for Honeywell Aerospace's Unmanned Aerial Systems and Urban Air Mobility Business Unit. Uh, he's led Honeywell's Aerospace UAS UAM Business Unit since its creation in March 2020. Mr. Fiemont, thank you for traveling from Phoenix to Washington, D.C. to testify today, and you're recognized for your opening statement. Chair Cinema, Ranking Member Cruz, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to today's uh, hearing to discuss Honeywell's perspective on the upcoming FAA Reauthorization Act with respect to integrating new entrants into the national airspace system. My name is Stefan Fima. I am the Vice President and General Manager of Honeywell's Urban Air Mobility and Unmanned Aerial Systems Business Unit. Honeywell Aerospace is proudly based in Arizona, a leader in the aerospace industry and home to 19 of our facilities and nearly 7,000 employees. Honeywell invented the autopilot over 100 years ago and continues to innovate to this day. We are in a great position to help shape the future of advanced aerial mobility. Our urban aerial mobility lab in Phoenix is where we are pioneering technologies without which these aircraft just are not possible. Examples include automated flight control and actuation systems, electric propulsion systems that enable ultra-quiet and emission-free aircraft, detect and avoid systems to prevent collisions with other aircraft and obstacles. In particular, Honeywell invests a large portion of our R&D into technology that makes flight more sustainable, such as electric power generation, hydrogen fuel cells, and sustainable aviation fuel. These new aircraft are set to be the most profound change in the aerospace industry and in people's lives since the invention of the jet engine. They will take off and land vertically just like a helicopter and fly on their wings just like an airplane. During takeoff and landing, they are no louder than a modern dishwasher, enabling them to pick you up and drop you off right in your neighborhood. They can do the same for cargo enabling companies to fly goods directly from warehouse to warehouse and streamline the supply chain. Small drones can drop off small parcels directly to your home and emergency supplies to disaster areas. However, the lack of a clear pathway to the certification of these aircraft and an absence of regulation to enable long distance commercial drone operations challenge this industry. Countries that lead in the development of new modes of transportation establish or reaffirm their global leadership. We have seen this before in the auto industry, the rocket industry, and the airline industry. But developing is not enough. We must also lead in implementation as well. Like the US has done in the past with the interstate highway system and like Europe has done with high-speed rail, 
This is the next new mode of transportation, and it is playing out today. The pace of technology innovation is accelerating, which means that the pace of regulation must also accelerate, or the United States will be left behind. It's time to come together to remove the regulatory gaps and make this a reality. We recommend that Congress mandate the FAA to have AAM aircraft certification regulations enacted by 2024. Validate AAM aircraft certified in Europe using our existing bilateral aviation safety agreements. Ensure its regulations are harmonized with these countries by 2024. Develop certification standards for autonomous aircraft, including unpiloted and reduced crew cargo and passenger carrying vehicles. And complete the rulemaking to enable regular beyond visual line of sight operations for drones of all sizes by 2024. At Honeywell, our single-minded mission is to co-create, together with leading aircraft designers, the advanced aerial mobility industry. I commend Chair Sinema, Senator Moran, and the committee for the recent passage of the Bipartisan Advanced Air Mobility Coordination and Leadership Act. I also applaud the efforts of the FAA, particularly in the Beyond Visual Line of Sight Rulemaking Committee, for working more closely with industry and stakeholders. Next year's FAA Reauthorization Act presents an important opportunity for Congress to make US global leadership in AAM and drones a top national priority and address the remaining regulatory gaps. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Ed Bolin, the president and CEO, president and CEO of the National Business Aviation Association. Mr. Bolin has led NBAA since 2004 and previously served in senior leadership roles at the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. He was appointed by President George W. Bush to serve on the Commission on the Future of the U.S. Aerospace Industry. Mr. Bolin, thank you for joining us today and you're recognized for your opening statement. Well, thank you, Chair Cinema, Ranking Member Cruz, members of the subcommittee. It's a great honor to be here today talking about an important milestone in the evolution of on-demand air mobility. You know, for decades, the National Business Aviation Association has represented companies that rely on general aviation aircraft to get people and products where they need to be when they need to be there. Over the decades, that has been evidenced in a variety of technologies. Companies have used biplanes and monoplanes, fixed-wing aircraft and rotor-wing aircraft. They've used propulsion systems, including radials and pistons and turbines. And the aircraft themselves have been built with wood and fabric, aluminum and composites. Today, the United States is fortunate to have the world's largest, safest, most efficient and most diverse air transportation system in the world. And our work country has benefited enormously from that. But today we have an opportunity to talk about technologies that can do even more. In your opening remarks, several of you mentioned the importance of predictability and certainty. And let me say this, we are all certain that advanced air mobility has the potential to bring enormous benefits to our country, to our citizens, to our communities. It has the potential to bring societal benefits and economic benefits and national security benefits. It has the ability to make on-demand air mobility more sustainable, more accessible, more affordable. We want and we need advanced air mobility. Here are some of the things that we as a country need to do. As Stefan said, we need to make it a national priority. We need a coordinated national strategy. We also need transparency, communication, and certainty in our regulations and our process. We need to have concurrent, collaborative work being done. Like the others, I want to thank Senator Sinema and Moran for the AAM Coordination and Leadership Act. That is important because it brings together different departments within the U.S. government 
to make sure we are working together, not at cross purposes. I also want to focus on what we need to do in terms of coordination and communication within the FAA, and that is we need to be concurrent and collaborative across all of the various lines of business. In order for AAM to come to the forefront, companies will need to get type certificates. They'll need to get production certificates. The operators will need operation specifications, and we're going to need an infrastructure that facilitates those operations. We need to work collaboratively and concurrently for all of those eventualities, not sequentially, one after another. This is an important opportunity. And I've already mentioned the infrastructure, and it's an infrastructure that is forward-looking. Today, the United States is blessed to have an amazing network of general aviation airports, 5,000 public-use uh, airports. They're in every congressional district. They're in some of our uh, tribal areas. They provide access to our air transportation system, to the world economy. In order for us to move forward, we need to recognize that the in infrastructure of the future will require electrification. It may require hydrogen. We have an opportunity to build for the future now. Here again, I want to thank Senator Moran, who worked with Senator Padilla to introduce, and this committee has passed, the Advanced, Air, the Advanced Aviation Infrastructure Modernization Act, an important opportunity to plan, uh, to provide grants for the planning and construction of the infrastructure of tomorrow. We need to be about that today. We also need to focus on the workforce of tomorrow. We're talking about technologies that are relying on electric propulsion, things that we don't necessarily have expertise within the FAA and within some of the uh, communities. We need to focus on how we bring the best and the brightest into our community as we go forward. As I said before, this is an important milestone in the evolution of transportation. It has the opportunity to benefit American citizens, communities, and our country. We look forward to working closely with every member of this committee, every member of Congress, everyone in the executive branch, and people all over the country to realize the benefits of advanced air mobility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'll go back to um, oh, Gregory Davis, the President Interim Chief Executive Officer of Aviation. And Mr. Davis, thank you so much for joining us today and you're recognized for your opening statement. Thank you very much. And, and if I may, just to confirm that the audio is now working. It is, thank you. Lovely, thank you very much. Well, good afternoon. My name is Gregory Davis and I'm the President and CEO of Aviation Aircraft. We are a manufacturer of all electric aircraft uh, based in Arlington, Washington. And we are currently in the process of developing the world's first all electric commuter aircraft with fully integrated battery technology and electrical propulsion. Uh, Chair Cinema, Ranking Member Cruz, Chair Cantwell, and Ranking Member Wicker, um, and members of the Subcommittee on Aviation Safety, Operations, and Innovation, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the policies and regulations needed to usher in the new era of sustainable aviation. Yesterday, and I should thank you again for the very warm welcome, yesterday we successfully completed the first flight of our zero emission aircraft, ALICE. It was an historic day, a uh, day for aviation history and a major milestone in electric aviation. It's the first time that an aircraft of this scale has successfully completed a flight, uh, and it was a moment of great pride for, I would say, all of us at aviation and for the aviation community in general. We were able to show people what affordable, clean, and sustainable aviation looks like and sounds like for the first time uh, in a fixed-wing all-electric aircraft. It has taken collabor collaboration across the aviation ecosystem to reach this groundbreaking moment. It is my hope that one day this type of travel will be so prevalent in our society we will not need to use the word electric to describe it. Electric aviation has the power to transform communities across this country. Specifically, if it can restore or provide essential air services to rural communities that are often underserved. Today, only about 500 of the 5,000 airports are served by any commercial flights, despite 60% of the population being within 10 miles of an airport, active or not, and 95% being within 25 miles. We have already seen 
early market traction from forward-thinking operators, including Cape Air and Global Crossing for passenger travel and global cargo company DHL for e-cargo. Uh, today, I'm here to share my insights on the key areas that must be prioritized in order to make electric aviation the standard for regional travel in the United States and beyond. My comments will be addressed around eCTOL, the electric conventional takeoff and landing aircraft market, um, while acknowledging my greater support for the advancement of all aspects of urban air mobility and sustainable aviation. eCTOLs, like Aviation's Alice, are part of the advanced air, air mobility market and will allow us to leverage the existing airport and airspace infrastructure in the United States by increasing flights without increasing pollution or our carbon footprint. First, we strongly encourage the FAA to look beyond the borders of the United States and to work with global regulators such as the ASA, the European Union the Aviation Safety Agency, and Transport Canada across the border on the paths towards certifying electric aircraft to make significant advancements and positive impact on the environment, electric aviation and sustainable aviation must be supported and adopted globally and quickly. Today's aviation, today, pardon me, aviation's fastest growing source uh, is the fastest growing source of greenhouse emissions worldwide. By 2050, our share of climate impact is expected to be 25 to 50% if nothing is done. The sustainability challenges is not only one country's challenge, it is a global challenge, and the United States has the immediate opportunity to take the leadership role. We must act with a sense of urgency to drive environmental progress, but also to push on global competitiveness and to remain out in front and attract the economic opportunity and prosperity in terms of manufacturing and jobs here in the United States. Second, it is important that the FAA focus on clear requirements for certification of battery technology, whether it pertains to an all-electric or hybrid aircraft. Standards need to be applied the same internationally so that we can focus on mass adoption of electric aviation. Global standards for battery technology will ensure that we stay focused on the greater task of reducing the environmental impact of aviation while also increasing the commercial availability and economic and social benefits of aviation globally. Third, we encourage the FAA to work with agencies from other departments, such as the Department of Energy, uh, on the development of charging infrastructure and battery technology. The, the DOE is, is already leading, ground, leading the world in terms of ground vehicle battery infrastructure with battery policies and initiatives. The same approach could be applied to the aviation industry to ensure that technology development is aligned with certification requirements for all electric aircraft. Further, there is an opportunity to tie in the Department of Energy on the expansion of aircraft charging networks to service rural and urban airports across the country. With the recent passing of Bill S-516, we believe there is clear direction to facilitate this engagement and we look forward to working with this committee as you consider initiatives for the FAA reauthorization in 2023. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to testify today. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for your opening statements. Your written statements will be entered for the record. And now we'll begin a round of questions for our witnesses.